You're listening to Conferences Online Allergy from Children's Mercy Hospital in Kansas City, Missouri. Today is September 27, 2019, and I'm your host, Dr. Jay Portnoy. Our topic today, Oral Challenges to Food. Our presenter is Dr. Justin Grywe. He's a clinical assistant professor of medicine in the Division of Allergy and Immunology at the University of Cincinnati in Cincinnati, Ohio. Pleasure. Thanks for having me. All right, guys. Uh, so I did this uh, last year um, and it was on um, food allergies, but this is a slightly different topic. Uh, we're going to be doing uh, food allergies as they pertain to the oral challenges. Um, I think this is an important topic uh, that tends to get overlooked. You know, you hear about all uh, OIT and, and um, uh, patches and all these new cool uh, therapies that are being developed, but uh, we often forget to focus on kind of the first main step in figuring out if these kids actually uh, have food allergies to begin with, and that's, of course, a, an oral food challenge. So let me get started. Um, quick uh, look at disclosures. I am a speaker for AstraZeneca, uh, Sanofi, Gendyme, and Regeneron. I'm on some advisory boards as well, AstraZeneca, Genentech, um, uh, a food company, and uh, um, it's a non-for-profit. So, With regards to uh, today's learning objectives, we're going to kind of dive into why food or uh, oral food challenges are so important, uh, especially in uh, your clinical practice um, when you're trying to determine uh, if kids actually have food allergies. Um, we're going to uh, talk about how to perform them in a manner that is uh, safe and effective and provides uh, patients and parents with more information and confidence moving forward. So uh, I'll be a little repetitive with my points, but that's just to drill home uh, some important uh, issues that we're going to talk about. So uh, starting off, before we get into the nitty gritty, the you know, important part about food allergies that uh, we need to discuss is, is the impact it has on the kids that we treat. Um, you know, this is a significant blow to a family, especially in, in, in patients or families where there isn't a history of food allergies or other atopic conditions. And so this can be a big change for them. And it can be tough because uh, a lot of uh, grandparents and other people in the family might not believe them or think it's a big deal. Uh, so quality of life is definitely impacted. Uh, and there's been lots of, of quality of life surveys that have been done um, uh, regard, regarding food allergy, specifically ones regarding food challenges. Uh, the good news is the quality of life tends to improve both before and after challenges, whether the, the child passes or not. So uh, another good reason why food challenges can be helpful is to um, just give patients more information about what their risks are. Uh, of course, there's social and psychological consequences as well. Uh, a lot of uh, patients and parents especially create a very um, uh, isolating environment. And this isn't every kid or parent, but, but there's a large proportion that, that do uh, um, you know, restrict their kids' activities, uh, forbidding sleepovers, birthday parties, uh, avoiding airplanes and sporting events. Um, a very small proportion go uh, even further and take their kids out of school and do homeschooling. So there's uh, a different approach for every parent and patient, but uh, it can be pretty isolating to the child and can bleed through into other siblings as well. And, and, and a lot of these kids uh, might have siblings that don't have food allergies, but they are treated as if they do. So um, it's an important concept to understand when you're talking to parents and, and patients for sure. Um, this hypervigilance, of course, can excel, instill an excessive amount of fear and anxiety, uh, which uh, I'm sure you guys likely see, and, and I see definitely in my practice, where it spills over into other areas of life. Uh, patients can be anxious in general, um, have fears about not just ingesting foods, but fears in other aspects of their life. So this is a um, something that's instilled early on and can persist into adulthood. So specifically regarding food challenges, and that's the main topic today, uh, of course, as you guys all know, that's the diagnostic um, standard for a diagnosis of food allergy. Um, I'm going to tell you and show you uh, that this is definitely underutilized in clinical practice, um, but it is the best way to determine if a patient's history is consistent with a food allergy. Um, and uh, it's important to note that um, 
you know, these, these, these tests that we do, both skin and blood testing, uh, are a guide and they are not um, unequivocal evidence that, that the patient has a food allergy. Um, so that's where the oral food, food challenge comes in. Uh, and definitely uh, going back to your residency uh, and, and intern year, the, the patient history is the most important part of this. It's not about the food tests. Uh, it's about the, the clinical history of reaction surrounding the food in question. So, so if you're not taking a detailed clinical history in these patients, you're doing them a disservice. So that's the first step be, before we think about skin tests or blood tests. Um, and like I said, these tests should not be absolute con should not be uh, absolute uh, contraindications for conducting a oral food challenge. It all depends on the history. So there's lots of reasons why we do food challenges. Um, of course, to identify uh, the concerning food, uh, looking for resolution of food allergies. Um, we're looking at the status of potentially other cross-reactive foods. A classic example would be uh, tree nuts uh, sensitivity in patients with peanut allergy. I would say the most common um, uh, tree nut uh, that uh, cross-reacts or we have dual allergies with in my practice is cashew pistachio along with the peanut, uh, but that can vary depending on the patient. Uh, a lot of uh, patients are allergic to crustaceans, but not, might not be allergic to mollusks. So those are helpful challenges. Um, of course, as we talked about, relieving parental or patient anxiety is huge. Um, there's sometimes where I give uh, food challenges to patients who have completely negative testing, who I uh, think and believe could do this at home very easily. But the problem is the patient and the, and the parent um, are both very anxious. So sometimes food challenges are done when we don't even think they need them. But it's just to, to say, hey, listen, I'll, I'll prove with, to you that this isn't an issue. Let's do it together while we both watch your kid in, in, in a close um, uh, observed setting. So um, th there is a risk of saying, hey, go home and introduce these foods, uh, because a lot of times you'll say that and then they'll come back a year later and you'll realize that they hadn't introduced those foods. So sometimes it's really important to have that conversation and really gauge if they're truly going to introduce those foods at home. And of course, uh, at least in my clinical practice, we use it for uh, ruling out uh, or be if a patient might be a candidate for OIT. So uh, the goal in, in all this is to accurately, of course, identify patients who will benefit. Um, this has been a, uh, a sticking point and an issue in our field for a long time and continues to be. Um, of course, a, a true food challenge should be ingestion of a meal-sized portion of the food uh, in its usual state. Um, uh, we're going to belabor this point, but a lot of people rely too heavily on skin tests and blood tests when deciding on which patients are good candidates for oral food challenges. Um, there's a lot of patients that have very intermediate values, uh, almost negative testing, um, and uh, there's unfortunately very limited data to suggest the predictive power of these, uh, th these tests. Um, there are certain allergists that I see that I get referrals from that if, if the serum test is over 0.35, they are officially allergic, whether they've had an ingestion reaction or not. So, so really uh, focus in on that uh, concept today, and I'm going to give you some data on why that's not appropriate medicine. Um, and, and unfortunately, I don't like to put this in, but, but, but food allergy still is, a, is an art as much as it is a science. Um, you know, clinical experience matters. The more you see, the, the, more, the better you are at, at distinguishing patterns in both the clinical history and the blood and the skin testing. But despite all that, despite all the food challenges I've done, uh, there are kids that will surprise you, whether in a good way or a bad way. So it, it, it's it's frustrating because you think of, of what we do as being very evidence-based and scientific, but in this case, uh, we're, we're still looking for those markers that are going to be give us they're going to give us more uh, accurate information. As of yet, we don't have that. Um, so so you're you're going to get more comfortable uh, the further along you get in your career. Um, but but I can tell you, even uh, even now, I, I still question my Myself with regards to some of these challenges. So uh, digging down uh, into the actual uh, testing that we do, of course, skin and blood testing are the main uh, components. Uh, we, we also do uh, component testing for some foods, uh, the most common being the component testing for peanut. Uh, and as we know, RH2 seems to be the strongest predictor of uh, severe of, of food allergy uh, anaphylaxis. Uh, I also use ovomucoid and casein in cases where uh, patients have milk and egg allergy. Uh, a lot of times these can give us more information about whether or not they'll pass uh, a baked uh, challenge. So those are um, blood work that I think are worth getting. Um, but again, it's important to point out that uh, uh, the cutoffs that are given in the literature are based on a particular patient population, and that might not be the patient that you're currently seeing in the office. 
So uh, below is kind of a, uh, a good example of tests that I've received in the past. This is actually uh, actual results from a, a real patient. Um, the uh, patient was a three-year-old uh, male with a history of uh, moderate to severe eczema. Uh, all these tests were drawn by a previous allergist. Uh, this is just a sampling of what was drawn. Uh, on the sides, you'll see the strawberry, mustard, melons, garlic, pine nuts, et cetera. Um, and uh, those were included in the testing. And uh, when we look at patients like this, there's, this is a, a big no-no, uh, in my opinion, because it provides very little uh, relevant information and a lot of re really uh, poor information. And uh, patients and, and doctors use this uh, inappropriately to um, dictate food diet eliminations, uh, et cetera. So uh, this is a perfect case where if you looked at the clinical literature, and compare these levels to levels that you know patients should should not pass or fail a challenge. You wouldn't challenge a patient to any of these foods, um, but uh, this patient actually passed each and every one, uh, despite the level of IgE. Now, of course, I bolded the total IgE, and you should never get food testing without that level, uh, especially in kids that are younger and atopic. Uh, this can really dictate uh, how you proceed with the challenge. So you should always be getting total IgEs and using that as a comparator to the other food allergies that you get. Um, you should never get very rare food allergies drawn and and my biggest pet peeve is when people just draw these broad panel food tests that are just in their emr they'll just click on the food test that includes tons of random foods uh and uh that leaves the patients with more questions than answers so really refrain from doing that and really focus in again using that clinical history of what foods the patient's actually reacting to don't go on a witch hunt because that's just going to lead to more problems um and as you can see here the, the positive predictive value for these tests are, are pretty uh pretty poor uh the negative predictive value is, is great but but the negative uh, the positive is, is not so um this is just one example of many um but this can be frustrating when you see these same patients come back time and time again with the same workups that include broad panel food tests. So uh, that's something to think about in the future. So of course, you know, given that these tests are so poor, uh, you know, more and more people are looking at different uh, modalities to test for food allergies, to test for resolution of food allergies. Um, uh, these, of course, are not um, available to everyone, uh, but there's some hope that we could get some better testing in the future. Uh, I look forward to that, but as of right now, we are uh, only using the serum IgE and the skin prick testing. So this is uh, older data from Samson uh, back in the uh, late 90s, early 2000s. And this is uh, data that you guys have probably seen uh, before the, the 90, 95 percent predictive, uh, predictive values uh, for, for skin tests or for, for challenges. Um, so when we look at uh, the, the graph, we see these classic cutoff points that we think of when we have patients with uh, peanut, milk, egg, soy, and wheat allergy. Um, and of course, as the, the levels reduce, um, challenges are indicated versus not indicated. Um, now, it's not very helpful, that bottom line, uh, when everything's negative, of course, that would require, wouldn't require a challenge. But um, uh, looking at the other levels, I'll show you that these levels aren't that accurate when we uh, uh, kind of dig into the data. Uh, these are other uh, snapshots of, of other similar values that have been published over the years. Uh, and again, I had these memorized back in fellowship, but um, they're not as helpful as I've learned um, going into practice. So this is a, a good example of a, test, of a study that was done um, that kind of looked into how we interpret these tests and in what patients. So on the left, you'll see two classes of patients, one with a clear history of reaction to peanut and one with an unclear history or a positive uh, skin test or blood test only. And as you look at the, at the lab values uh, at the top, going from negative to positive, um, you'll see that both uh, classes of patients did pass. Uh, and in some cases, in the majority, of course, uh, 76 and 88 percent on the left with negative testing, not surprising. Um, but as we go up, uh, there are a little bit of surprises. Uh, looking at the far right uh, with levels of over five, 77 percent of that class of unclear or negative or positive test only uh, passed. So you, you have you, you can't take all these tests at their base value. You have to, to think about potentially challenging. Um, 
and this is a good example of, of, of uh, you know, if it was, you know, 10% or 20% might not be worth the risk, but in patients where you have, you don't have a good clear clinical history and you have a 77% chance of passing, uh, that's that's pretty good in my book. So uh, use your clinical judgment um, and and use this data to, to consider challenging patients, even with levels that might not be um, uh, negative. So looking at other data that has been presented in the past, uh, and this is looking at guidelines to predict the likelihood of passing. Uh, other, other data has been looking at the likelihood of failing, um, but, but this is more helpful. Um, and looking at the cutoff values at which a 50% pass, pass rate could be expected, uh, milk and egg are two, uh, peanuts two, not unsurprising. Um, and again, we look at that level of five without a clear history reaction that was presented in the previous data. Uh, so these are all values you can think about. And and typically, if, you know, 50% seems to be my ideal area. If I, if I think a patient has a 50-50 chance of passing, then I, I tend to move forward. When we get into lower levels than that, then I, I'm, I'm more hesitant. Um, but, but this is uh, data that it's continuing to come out, and we need more of it because the more data we have, the better. Uh, so this is just more uh, attempts by uh, academics to create um, guidelines to help guide practitioners into when it's appropriate to challenge. And in this case, if where is it appropriate to challenge? Can you challenge at home? Can you challenge in the clinic? Or do you need to be referred to an infusion center or a hospital center uh, to get these challenges completed? Um, so this is this is kind of an attempt at triaging into low or high risk patients and and sending them to places that they can do this safely. Now, in my opinion, I think that the, the, the lab values and this contest values might be a little conservative. Um, and you know, we are we always are concerned about healthcare costs, et cetera. So um, most challenges I, I do in the clinic. If I if I think a patient requires a hospitalization to get a challenge done, um, that's probably a patient where I don't think they have a 50-50 chance of passing. Now, of course, in clinical trials, especially with OIT, a lot of those patients required challenges, even though they had histories of reactions or high blood tests or skin tests. But in clinical practice, um, we don't have to be as stringent in those rules and regulations. So uh, I, don't, I don't typically refer out to a, to a local hospital to get these challenges done. I just do them as, myself. But, but again, good good attempts. But it's tough. It's tough to, to, to determine or, or to create universal diagnostic criteria because, again, it, every patient is so different. Uh, there's so many, uh, you know, factors that can contribute to whether or not these tests are accurate or not. So you, you can't take any of this at face value because every patient's different. And I'll give you some, some, some data to show why. So these are two graphs back to back that are interesting um, factors modulating the interpretation of allergy tests. Uh, you don't have to memorize these, I, I, you know, but it's, it's something that uh, you should always keep in the back of your mind with regards to when you're interpreting uh, allergy tests. So when you're looking at, um, of course, a recent history of reaction, uh, younger age, uh, atopic populations, those are, 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 are situations where you should, you should take it more seriously. Um, of course, when you're looking at uh, patients with uh, inhalant allergies, or like we talked about, broad panel food testing in atopic individuals, the, the accuracy of the tests might not be as helpful. That goes for African-Americans as well. Sometimes. Um, uh, they can have abnormal results because they have higher levels of um, allergen-specific IgE, um, but, but with decreased clinical relevance. Re um, so, so it's important to to think about these. And a lot of patients with lots of air allergen sensitivities can have elevated levels on food tests. Um, and then of course, factors influencing the decision to perform an oral food challenge. Uh, we're looking at uh, history of reactions, recent exposures causing issues that would you know make you, you think twice before doing a challenge. Um, of course, if you don't have a lot of resources available, um, that's difficult to perform challenges. But other other issues, um, of course, looking at low specific IgE levels, the importance of the food in the diet. I have, I have patients uh, from different cultural backgrounds that um, tend to put more emphasis on certain foods. I know a lot of my patients from uh, India, uh, tree nuts tend to be more of an issue, or even from Europe where hazelnuts are used a lot more. So, so it depends on uh, on the patient and their preferences. So it's important to have those conversations and and maybe push challenges in situations where um, that food is really important to them. So uh, it's a conversation you should have with the parents um, and the patient and, and talk about the risks and benefits and, and then make a clinical decision. But, uh, but all things to, to keep in mind when you're talking to parents. 
So this is interesting data. Um, it, it's data that will likely be published um, in the next uh, year. Um, it, we had a, a group of um, uh, adverse reaction to food committee uh, members who got together and put together a survey looking at the trends in oral food challenges. This was based off of a previously published survey back in 2012. Um, but we, we, we used the survey data from that, um, from that survey. Uh, we repeated a lot of the questions, but also added some additional questions specifically regarding uh, challenges to infants. So this really gets a, um, a good look into how what people are thinking about when they do oral food challenges, what are the barriers to doing it in their office. Um, and this was distributed to both the college and the quad AI. Um, and uh, let's dig into the data. So the good news is the most, most of the people feel like uh, food challenges are important. Uh, open non-blinded challenges is the method of choice. Uh, looking at the top three perceived barriers to performing oral food challenges uh, with the original study, uh, lack of time, reimbursement, and risk of adverse events were the three most common. Uh, over the last decade, those have changed a little bit. Of course, lack of time is, is still number one, but now we're looking at lack of staff and lack of office space. So it doesn't seem like, um, you know, the reimbursement or concern for reactions or safety is an issue as much anymore, although those still were higher on the list. It really is more kind of logistics, like how do I how do I do this within the time frame of my busy schedule? Uh, how do I do this and not take up other patient rooms? So these are all kind of important uh, logistic issues that seem to be more prevalent, of course, in the private practice side, um, but it really affects um, both academic and private practice allergists. So interesting um, data that we, we've seen over the last 10 years. Um, uh, oddly enough, only 58% perform about one to five oral food challenges a month. Um, seems uh, like a decent amount, but again, in a practice like mine, I'm, I'm doing uh, two to three, even sometimes four a day. So, so the demand is there, and I, I think we're not meeting that if, if allergists are only performing one to five uh, per month. So there definitely needs to be a change. And, and the reason why I say the demand is there is, uh, you know, we're not just talking about kids that, that have food allergies um, that have done avoidance and, and used their epinephrine injectors in the past. We're looking at patients that are looking into doing OIT or potentially doing patches in the future or some of these other therapies that are coming out. And in order to, you know, pick a patient population that is appropriate for that, uh, challenges are indicated. And of course, we're looking at uh, also with the new indications from LEAP, uh, infants that require challenges now that, that in the past maybe we, we ignored. So so the, the, the need for challenges is in, increasing and unfortunately we're not able to, I don't think we're able to keep up with the demand. Um, another uh, interesting aspect of the survey showed that only 82% obtained written, written informed consent, which uh, I think in my opinion should be 100% uh, whenever a, a procedure like this is, is done. Uh, the risks uh, and benefits need to be explained uh, and I think documentation is key in a situation like this. So um, looking at training in the survey, 56% um, uh, performed less than 10 in their entire fellowship. Um, but oddly enough, 29% uh, performed no oral food challenges. Now, the majority of those patients, uh, those um, uh, fellows, uh, did fellowship a long time ago. ACGME, uh, of course, recently requires that fellows uh, participate in at least five oral food challenges, but of course doesn't specify, uh, is this a higher risk challenge, is this a lower risk challenge? So um, I'm not sure if even then the, the training is sufficient for, for going off on your own and doing this in your office. Um, but, but definitely improved fellowship training is important uh, and, and going to be a top priority moving forward. Uh, for safety, uh, of course, most allergists are concerned about this, um, but despite their concern, only 60% have standardized protocols in place um, and only 56% had emergency medicine ready and available. So uh, those are kind of standard uh, pieces of information that we should have at our disposal at all times if we're performing challenges in our office. So looking at safety, since that seems to be uh, a concern for most patients, or, and of course, uh, practitioners, uh, there's some data that suggests that oral food challenges may, might, might be much safer than they, pre they were previously perceived. So um, a large um, uh, study was done with over 6,000 patients, uh, and about 86% successfully um, challenged to their food with no reaction. Uh, only about 2% required epinephrine, uh, which is in contrast to previous studies, which ranged anywhere from 6 to 33%. Um, looking at most of the data across the board, late phase and biphasic reactions, uh, although a very real concern uh, for parents, which comes up a lot, uh, is actually pretty rare. And I have only a handful of biphasics that I've seen in my career so far. Um, 
only one known fatality in the U.S. Uh, since the uh, description of modern oral flu challenges, and that was back in the 1970s. So, you know, from a pure statistic, statistic uh, standpoint, uh, the risk for severe or uh, uh, fatalities in this uh, subgroup of patients is pretty rare. Um, there was another fatality outside of the U.S. I think it was in Japan uh, during an OIT entry challenge, but but given the all the patients that came before this, um, these these should be uh, done in, a, in an observed setting. But as you can see, the, the, the results is, is this is a very safe procedure to do. So um, when we dig, dug down into more details with the survey we provided, um, the previous survey did not include information about infant challenges, um, but we did include it based on the um, uh, National Institutes of Allergy and Infectious Disease guidelines. So 79% um, encourage caregivers to um, incorporate peanut into the diet, and this is regarding uh, infants 4 to 11 months. 50% uh, followed those rec the recommendations for skin testing high-risk infants. 38% uh, uh, routinely performed uh, challenges uh, for the purpose of early introduction, um, but 36% didn't provide the resource at all. So um, despite having these, these very well thought out uh, published guidelines, um, unfortunately not a lot of allergists are following through. Now, that might be a, a, a situation where they're not seeing a lot of infants or aren't getting referrals. Uh, they might still be stuck in pediatricians' offices, not um, knowing about this data, uh, but it's definitely something that needs to be addressed, and and, uh, and we need to seek out these patients so that we can provide uh, the good recommendations. Um, uh, oddly enough, 25% were less willing to perform oral food challenges uh, after the recent publication or after the recent um, fatality. Uh, so, so you know, hearing those stories, of course, is scary. But again, looking at the data overall and the statistics, uh, I think we should be confident that uh, that oral food challenges are still safe and should be still provided for patients. So ultimately, what do we learn about the, uh, from the survey? Um, you know, there are some significant improvements that are occurring, especially in the last 10 years. Um, definitely, we talked about lack of training and fellowship should be addressed. Uh, of course, this hesitancy in challenging infants, which should be our, our main focus uh, based on a lot of good data. Um, and uh, the concern about consent uh, being not universal. I think that's uh, a really important part. And uh, all the uh, risks should be um, stated to the patient before, that's, um, before you proceed. So um, I think we can make some targeted efforts and hopefully uh, in 10 years, if we repeat this survey, we can see even uh, more improvements moving forward. So um, the next few slides are just about how do you prepare your office? And then this definitely um, would be more helpful for those of you that might be moving on to private practice, um, but definitely can can also apply to patients or for, to physicians in the academic setting. But but this goes across the board. Preparation is key. So it's important because you're going to save, save yourself a lot of time uh, in the future is focusing on um, all the, the, the meat and the, and the meaty stuff at the beginning. You know, that first appointment should be jam-packed full of information for the patient, uh, handouts uh, if appropriate, and really just provide them with a lot of information because those patients are starving for it when they first get diagnosed. They want to know, what does this mean for me? What does this mean for my child and my family? Uh, how dangerous is this? How concerned do I need to be? Um, because this, this visit sets the tone for um, a lifetime of potential, like we talked about, anxiety and fear. So I think this is an important time to um, provide your professional opinion, uh, but also not uh, just talk about fear, 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 fear. Don't touch, don't touch, don't touch. Uh, and and because I get I get a lot of patients that come to me and say, wow, I I got it was it was really scary that last visit I had with my allergist. Um, he really uh, kind of struck the fear of God in me. And and I think it's important to provide a healthy respect for the food. But, but I think you can go overboard in that as well. And I think it's important that kids have a healthy respect for the food allergen, but I don't want that food allergen to define them. A lot of parents will go on to say, you know, Johnny is my food allergic kid. Um, but I don't, I don't want that mentality. I want the parent to say, Johnny's my, my athlete or, you know, my sweet kid. I, I want him to, to describe it by what things he likes. I don't want them to describe it by a medical condition. So, so that's where the, that initial conversation is important. And especially if you're going to move on to oral food challenges, uh, setting it up so that they know what to expect at their next visit. Uh, so so um, a really concerted effort by both you or and or the, the nursing staff or ancillary staff is important. Um, we talked about, of course, standardized informed consent, which I think you should uh, have in every situation. Um, uh, but talk to the parents about what are the risks, uh, what are the reasons we're doing this, uh, what are the benefits. Um, 
And, and, and some patients, what is a food challenge? Because a lot of patients are concerned uh, or confused when they heard about OIT and challenges and all this other stuff. So they, they need more information about what is this and, and what does that mean if he passes or fails. Um, also important, of course, is who's going to bring the food in. Uh, at least in our clinical practice, uh, the patients bring their own food in. Uh, for baked recipes, we provide them with a standardized baked milk and baked egg recipe, and they will bring those muffins in with them. So um, uh, we give them brands and, and other um, websites where they can go to and, and get the, the nuts that we would like or the foods that we would like to use. Uh, so that's an easy way that puts less stress on your staff. Uh, and, uh, of course, if they pass, the patients can bring the food back with them and, and, and eat them. So um, a lot of times we'll, we'll actually reach out to patients before the challenge. Uh, this is especially important in infants to make sure that there's no um, illnesses or maybe a flare-up of allergies or asthma that could affect the interpretation of the challenge. So we don't want patients that are currently going, undergoing an asthma exacerbation or have horrible seasonal allergies where they're dripping and draining everywhere to, to, to proceed with a challenge in the office. We want them healthy. Uh, we want them symptom-free. So a call a couple of days before can sometimes tease out who, who should stay on the schedule and who shouldn't. Um, the, uh, of course, optimizing control is really important. So at that initial visit, visit you, sh you should, of course, be going through other atopic conditions, um, maximizing their asthma therapy, maximizing their allergic rhinitis and eczema therapy. Uh, again, this minimizes risk for reaction as well as um, prevents or, or reduces uh, misinterpretation of results. You don't want uh, a patient that already has a really bad rash on their skin um, say, well, there's a new rash. Was that the new rash or is that just the same eczema? Um, is, is that cough because he's not having well-controlled asthma or is that a new cough? So, so those are all things to keep in mind when you're, when you're um, proceeding with the challenge. Um, of course, uh, with regards to uh, details of the, the day, and this is usually what my nurses go over with patients is, you know, what happens on the day of the test? How long do I need to take off? Um, what's the sequence? You know, what, 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 what should, I, should I expect? Um, uh, what should I bring in? Can I bring in other foods? Is that safe to do in an allergist office? Can I bring in tablets, et cetera? So, so just a, a brief description. And, and of course, certain challenges last um, longer than others. Um, for OIT, of course, like for the first day buildup, we're there for you know more than a few hours. But uh, depending on the challenge, they, they should have, definitely have information on what to expect that day. So um, this is especially important for infants and toddlers. Uh, sometimes they can be more difficult to complete a challenge. Uh, so making sure that they're hungry when they come in. Um, a lot of parents will bring their toddlers in and say, oh, we just ate, and he, he's refusing to eat, which can be frustrating. So, so try to uh, avoid meals right before. Scheduling that between uh, either around breakfast time or lunch time can be helpful so that they're hungry. Uh, making sure to bring in foods that they can already tolerate that they really like to help uh, mix with the um, peanuts or whatever food they're challenging to. Um, anything that can improve their chances of, of, of passing the challenge. Um, toys, tablets, activities, um, keeping them distracted. And I think distraction is helpful, not only for the pa patients, but for the parents as well. Um, you know, it's, it's, it's frustrating because a lot of parents uh, are so anxious. And again, we talked about that anxiety that bleeds in, not just with the kids, but the parents as well. Um, if, if the parent is constantly asking the kid, how do you feel? Are you reacting? Do you have any itch? How's your throat? You know, that 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 tends to add up for the kid. And eventually, after even though the kid's not having any issues, uh, might say, well, yeah, now that I think of that about it, maybe my throat is a little tight, or maybe maybe I do feel itchy. So so trying to limit those those interactions between the parent and kid, uh, that anxious interaction. And of course, uh, if there are issues, we, we want to know what they are. But but um, whether that's with TV or in our case, we actually have a, a, a group area where multiple kids are challenging at the same time, which uh, actually is to the benefit of the patients and parents because a lot of parents get in conversations and start talking about their shared experiences. The kids will play together or play board games and so it's a great um, uh, venue for um, shared talk but also for um, keeping people entertained and, and distracted so that uh, they're not they're not thinking about their bodies all the time um, and uh, you know sometimes things can uh, go wrong whether that's nausea vomiting etc uh, if that occurs we take them out of the shared room and bring them into their own private room uh, but but I think that's a, a nice way to, to do a challenge where people can have that shared experience and um, and uh, be distracted. So uh, before we challenge, of course, we always make sure that the patient is well controlled. Having that conversation two days before is helpful, but the day of we do peak flow monitoring for all our patients uh, to make sure that they're um, 
breathing is well controlled. Um, we, for a lot of patients, do pre-screening spirometries before they come in, especially if there's any question of asthma in the clinical history to make sure their lung function is appropriate. Um, and of course, we have epinephrine available for our challenges as well. Um, but uh, during the, the, the challenge procedure, we're, comp we're, we're constantly repeating these values, repeating peak flows, uh, so that we have um, spots and time to, to use as references uh, as we move forward in case there's a reaction. Of course, documentation is key. Um, that's important not only for your staff uh, and for you if you ever uh, need to refer back to it, but of course for medical legal purposes, um, making sure that all the doses are, are written down, signs and symptoms, physical exam findings, uh, vital signs, et cetera. Uh, and that should be documented in, uh, in, your, in your note. We have a flow sheet that we use that uh, the nurses can fill in while they're doing the challenge. Uh, and there's lots of examples of those online. Uh, for extra added safety, we color code all of our charts. So if a patient is coming in for sesame or for peanut or for tree nuts, we know uh, by not only the name, but also the color on the chart. Again, a little redundancy never hurts. Um, so that's how we approach uh, the safety uh, aspect of it. And again, if you look at our, um, our, our office, both of our offices are set up where the nurses have a bird's eye view of the entire testing area. So they can watch and hear uh, each and every patient that's performing a challenge. They're not off in some room closed off uh, down the hall. They're, they're, they're available. Now, that might be difficult for some practices. Your practice site might not be set up like that. But if you have the ability to either build a new practice or um, re renovate your practice, keep that in mind when you're, when, if you think that food challenges will be an important part of your practice. So um, pre-assigned roles is important, and this just creates continuity of care um, and consistency long-term. Uh, because we do so many challenges, um, I have certain expectations for my nurses, and they have certain expectations for me. We each know what our roles are, um, and uh, because of that, uh, our challenges go very smoothly. Uh, they can take care of issues that are mild or uh, not concerning, and of course, they are welcome to interrupt me in any patient room if there's any concerns of a reaction. So we have this very specific um, treatment course that we abide by, and uh, we always know, uh, hey, this is when we stop, this is when we treat, uh, this is when you come get me, and it seems to work out really well. So, so having the, that, that, that detailed discussion with your staff prior to, to starting a, a robust oral food challenge clinic is really important. And of course, you know, having a plan in case anyone needs to be transferred to the emergency department, we've never had to do that in our practice, um, but our, our nurses are proficient at putting in uh, IVs um, and doing other, any other treatments that we would need to stabilize patients should we need to transfer them to the ER. Um, this is just a, a published stopping criteria um, that was uh, published in uh, Journal of Allergy and Clinical Monology in Practice. Uh, back in 2017, and this was uh, helpful for infant food challenges specifically. Um, that just gives providers a, a guideline of, of when to stop um, challenges. So I think it's a pretty good chart uh, and something that you should uh, at least take a look at. Um, and uh, again, maybe use as a guide for some of your nurses or ancillary staff if they're wondering uh, what, what, what symptoms to look out for. Um, a lot of the trials and infant food challenges had low rates of anaphylaxis, uh, likely because they, they use this protocol. Um, so, so it's helpful. Uh, every kid's different um, and every scenario is different, but this is used as a guide to help you. And of course, when we talk about infants, and this might be a reason why maybe not all allergists are comfortable uh, challenging in this age group um, is, of course, they're nonverbal. Um, they have, uh, you know, different signs and symptoms uh, when they have reactions. And this is just a brief overview of what to expect since we do challenge a lot of infants in my practice. Um, of course, you know, you're not going to feed a, a teenager the amount of food that you would feed an infant in the challenge. So, of course, portion sizes are important. Um, and you may have to alter your challenge based on how the infant is feeling that day. So, uh, there's been times where we've done challenges and the kids maybe, maybe only ate um, a, a quarter of a muffin and then refused to eat any more. Uh, so, we might say, hey, go home on a quarter of a muffin and then uh, come back in a few months and we'll, we'll try again. Uh, and then you try a larger dose. So, uh, um, you, you've got to, you know, use your clinical intuition, um, get creative, um, and, and they might not pass a full challenge with a full portion of amount, but, but if, they, if they eat a little bit and they don't have an issue but don't want more, then have them come back. So it's important to, to not be so concrete with your, your diagnosis. It's not just pass-fail all the time. Sometimes it can be uh, an intermediate. 
Uh, of course, with infants, we're using softer pureed forms of foods. Uh, a lot of times we'll use bomba treats for peanuts, which are easier to, to, for the kids to eat. Um, of course, we'll, we want to use we'll avoid choking hazards uh, like peanuts or tree nuts. Um, and I have multiple alternative um, uh, varieties available. So whether that's bomba treats, peanut butter, uh, have different vehicles so that uh, uh, if one doesn't work, we can try another. Um, a lot of kids uh, like chocolate, of course, so a lot of parents bring in uh, chocolate syrup uh, or other candy treats, marshmallows, uh, et cetera. And, and don't, don't set specific time lengths because infants are more difficult. Uh, sometimes the visit might take longer. So uh, the infant's going to dictate the, the visit length, not the, not the doctor. Um, make sure that you know what the weight-based doses are for emergency medications in these age groups. Be, uh, be um, uh, aware of what vital sign changes are different. Um, and uh, typically we avoid nap time or other times of the day where kids get cranky um, and uh, inconsolable. So um, looking at what <clears throat> kind of symptoms we see in oral food challenges, uh, the good news is, for, especially for infants, uh, most of the reactions are pretty mild, uh, and they mainly are cutaneous. So hives um, is the number one I issue in patients uh, one year of age or younger. So um, anaphylaxis, of course, is similar to previous studies at around 2%, um, but uh, you'll get more swelling and other ancillary symptoms uh, the, the older people get. I would say that, that GI upset and vomiting is another uh, big concern, especially for older patients. Um, I would definitely say if you have a food allergy testing area that's carpeted, you might want to rethink that. Uh, hardwood uh, or linoleum is, is definitely uh, a better option because you will get vomit on your floor, I guarantee it. Um, so uh, we'll look at some other subtle clues from infants especially. So ear picking, tongue, rub tongue rubbing, putting hands on the mouth, neck scratching, um, increased fussiness, et cetera, are, are things to look out for. Um, of course, older, older patients are able to tell you more, but definitely that nausea and abdominal pain is, is usually kind of one of the first symptoms we see is, ooh, I, you know, my belly hurts or I'm upset. That's when you kind of push the, the trash can over closer to them. Um, and um, uh, again, depending on how they're doing, you want to make sure you're differentiating between IgE and non-IgE non immediate symptoms. Sometimes that in, in, in involves altering your challenge protocol a little bit, maybe waiting more in between doses, maybe adding an extra dose. Um, so those are all things that you need to think about when you're doing a challenge. And of course, like we talked about in our practice, we have close nursing observation uh, at all times, um, and they're able to both hear and see the patient during the, the challenge procedure. Uh, at least in our practice, we always make sure a physician's uh, in the office available should any reaction occur. Um, and especially for the younger kids, uh, avoid contact with the hands and the lips and the face. Um, there can be contact reactions or irritations that can be concerning to parents or kids, and that might um, prevent you from moving forward with the challenge. So uh, if it's an infant or a young toddler, making sure that um, you, you put that food in his mouth or her mouth without touching a lot of the outside. So a lot of patients especially will, will touch the food and then rub their eyes which can cause issues. Uh, we, we, we touched on this a little bit earlier, um, but using a failed challenge as a teaching point, it seems um, like that might be a little tough because they're reacting, but I would say that I always use a, a reaction, especially in kids that have never had anaphylaxis before, as an opportunity to say, hey, this is what it feels like. We, let's stay calm. Um, we're going to give you epinephrine. This is how epinephrine feels. Um, this is what the needle looks like. Um, and, and oddly enough, uh, it actually goes pretty well. A lot of Parents and patients really appreciate the fact that you coach them through that that, that scary uh, reaction, and then that gives them more confidence uh, moving forward because now they know, hey, epinephrine doesn't hurt that much when it's given, and wow, I felt so much better after that dose. So, so it really gives patients and parents confidence uh, when you use that as a teaching opportunity because again, those teaching opportunities don't come 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 very often. Um, and we talked about empowerment versus despair and confidence, not fear. Uh, that's that's easier said than done. Uh, and I think that comes with clinical experience and, and how you interact with your patients. But if you can gear your, your conversations toward those um, those things, I think you're going to notice a, a better uh, relationship with your, your, your patients and your parents. And of course, if they pass, which is awesome, uh, the one thing you want to do is make sure that they're continuing to maintain that in their diet. Uh, studies in the past uh, have shown consistently that a lot of patients will not reintroduce their allergic foods once they pass. Uh, of course, peanuts and tree nuts are the most common. A lot of times these kids don't like the taste, so they're not thrilled to continue to eat it. 
Um, but there are there is evidence to suggest that uh, with continued avoidance, this could um, redevelop as an allergy. So uh, I think it's an important conversation to have. Uh, don't just say you've passed and we'll see you, um, uh, we won't see you again. I think it's important to follow up. Um, there's even a deba debate uh, about whether or not to uh, tell patients to continue to carry their EpiPen for another year after they, they pass. I, I, don't, I don't typically recommend that, but, but it's uh, a debate that a lot of allergists do have. Um, but uh, addressing the reasons why they're not consuming the food reg regularly, of course, disliking the food is number one, but also that fear is difficult to um, get out of their minds. Uh, and of course, once the kids and families have stopped eating foods, it's hard to get them to put them back into their diet. Uh, these are just three classic case examples um, of different patients that you'll see in your office. Uh, the first being an OIT evaluation, the second being uh, a severe atopic dermatitis patient, and then the third being uh, a patient referred for multiple allergies uh, on a restricted diet. So that first patient is coming in for an OIT evaluation. Uh, if you guys uh, do this in the future or currently do this, um, it, it's a conversation we have a lot with pa parents and patients, especially in kids that have never been exposed. You know, they might have uh, IgE levels that are high or skin tests that are high, but uh, like we talked about before, do, do you challenge these foods? Um, of course, in, in, in the clinical trials leading up to OIT, uh, a lot of those patients did have anaphylaxis, a lot higher than that 2% in some of the other trials we talked about. So, so definitely the risk for anaphylaxis is higher in this subgroup of patients, and that's important to keep in mind. Um, so these are just good, uh, this is a good study by noon that, that really showed that uh, this group is a little bit higher risk, of course, than, than the regular uh, patients that we see. Um, again, it's important, uh, and oddly enough, I see a lot of allergists refraining from testing these patients because they're concerned that even the test, like the skin test, might cause an anaphylactic reaction. Uh, I, I never have disqualified someone from getting a skin test based on a history of severe reaction. Every patient's a candidate for skin prick testing or blood testing, of course. Um, but um, uh, when you're doing these challenges in the office, again, you want to make sure you have a really good um, framework in place using all the things we talked about before. Uh, but in my opinion, clinics should not offer OIT if they're hesitant to provide oral food challenges at any age. I think that should be uh, a big no-no. Uh, if, if you if you want to utilize OIT, you've got to have that 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 foundation first. Um, you know, you you don't send um, you know people out uh, in, into a lake to swim if they don't know how to swim. So you you got to make sure that they've got the basics first. Um, this is a patient with uh, bad uh, eczema, and we talked about these patients having uh, abnormal blood tests and, and a, a kind of poor positive predictive, predictive value given their high false positive rate. Um, so, you know, we, we want to make sure we're, we're especially paying attention to this, this subgroup of patients um, because they, they are often the patients that get misdiagnosed or, or get told to avoid multiple foods. Um, and that tends to persist into uh, not just infancy, but toddlerhood and then sometimes through their life. Um, unfortunately, with this age group, we're, we don't know as much about the cutoffs that are appropriate for this age or for this uh, condition. So um, I'll show you some data there as well. Um, you know, food triggered uh, atopic dermatitis is always front of mind for a lot of parents. Uh, a lot of them think that if you just get rid of a certain food, their eczema will clear and go away. I think, uh, you know, an honest conversation about that uh, is important with the parents. Um, now, food can trigger AD in some situations, but it's definitely not as prevalent as is perceived in the community. So uh, it's important to, to, to address that concern with parents. Um, and again, uh, interpreting uh, results on blood and skin testing in a new, more nuanced way. So um, a couple studies um, that were done looking at AD uh, patients specifically, and again, just showing that uh, patients were able to challenge and pass uh, a lot more uh, frequently than patients without AD. So, so their numbers on scan and blood test uh, weren't as predictive in this subgroup of patients. So a lot of them had uh, very high success rates when, when doing challenges in the office. Again, more, more information here about that. Um, uh, just more, more data to suggest that these levels uh, may not be predictive uh, in patients with AD. So, and the ultimate point here is allergists you should be more aggressive about offering challenges in, the, in this subgroup of patients. And then finally, this is a patient where we, we get a lot of these broad panel food tests and they've got multiple allergies, including garlic and melons and strawberries and everything else. Uh, so teasing out 
uh, this diet, uh, restrictive diet is really important because a, a lot of a lot of kids will come in with, you know, eating you know, rice and 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 uh, and oats and, and and maybe you know one other food and they'll be really restricted. So it's important to to tease out all this information and make sure that we're not unnecessarily avoiding foods. Um, and and these the, these these studies suggest that uh, a lot of patients were able to pass. Um, despite having a, a diagnosis of food allergy. Um, younger age groups were risk factors for failed challenges in this, in this subgroup, as well as meat allergy, meat allergy as well. Um, the uh, occurrence of uh, reaction, uh, of any reaction or anaphylaxis uh, was about 18.8%. Um, which is which is much lower than reactions observed for the classic food allergens like peanut, egg, milk, and wheat. So uh, the pass rate for for rare foods was was exceptionally good. It was 81 percent, and that's uh, backed up by other uh, studies by Samson um, and, and and Fleischer, which which also showed very high pass rates for kids with rare food allergens. Um, this is just a, one of the graphs from um, the the paper that just shows that that the majority of patients pass with no reaction. And, and what we're trying to do here is avoiding strict elimination diets that can lead to, you know, picky eating and poor nutrition. So um, I'm going to try to summarize here in the next couple of slides because I know we're almost done. Um, so the demand for oral food challenges, as we talked about, is, is definitely increasing, especially in the infant and toddler age group. Um, there's a lot more food centers that are popping up across the U.S. Um, the Im implementation of early introduction policies um, that involves uh, high-risk infants and children uh, are, are impacting oral food challenge rates. Um, and of course, the advances in, in peanut uh, immunotherapy as well as other foods, uh, which is going to just increase the demand. So, um, the all this, all these guidelines, all these, all these emerging therapies are really predicated on our willingness to perform oral food challenges in the office. And if we can't meet that demand, then there's going to be a lot of patients that are um, that are either inappropriately put on these therapies uh, or are missing out. So I think um, that's, that should be the, the take-home point from this talk. Um, and again, all patients are potential candidates for oral food challenge. Uh, you, you really have to dig into the details. I wouldn't at face value say no way for anybody. You always got to say, well, tell me about the history. Tell me about the exposures. Uh, don't take anything at face value. Do your own investigation. Um, and uh, I think if you do that, and, and hopefully with this talk, uh, you can gain more confidence, and hopefully you, you can instill more confidence in your patients and parents. Um, but we're, we're really trying to focus, and, and my biggest goal in, in doing this talk is to really try to implore you guys that when you go out into your practices to, to make this an important part of your clinical practice, even though if you don't think you might not have enough time or enough room or enough staff, it can be done, and it can be done uh, effectively. Uh, so thank you very much, and I'm not sure if we have any time for questions or anything like that. I have a I question. Have, Thank you for your talk. It was uh, really, really good. Um, I like how you described um, with regards to how to interpret a food challenge as a spectrum, not just pass-fail, but you may have some people who fall into that intermediate category. Um, so my question about that is, let's say you had an infant who did a food challenge and they were in that intermediate category, like they only ate a fourth of a muffin. What do you tell them to do between then and when they come back for a food challenge in terms of avoidance of the food? Do they strictly avoid, like, do you tell them to strictly avoid the food? Do you tell them that they can eat up to, you know, one-fourth of that muffin? What is, mm -hmm. what is your personal kind of... Um, yeah. How do you personally manage that? Yeah, no, it's a good question. Um, and I think a lot of uh, physicians do use it at very black and white where they're not thinking about the, 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 the details of in between. So for infants that specifically can't finish the challenge because of just they're fussy or they're just, they're just done and, and they can't eat anymore, then usually I'll just say, okay, try to feed the last tolerated dose uh, as regularly as you can um, up until our next appointment when we can challenge uh, to a, a greater amount. Um, there are kids, and especially older kids, that might do a big challenge, and we might get to the very end, and they might have a vomiting episode or uh, a, a milder reaction. And so even in those patients who technically you could say failed the challenge because they reacted, um, I would say let's bring that back down. And instead of, you know, you reacted to two muffins in the office, maybe let's try a, a fourth of a muffin every day for the next couple months, and let's see how you do. And then after that time frame, I say, okay, you, you've done well on a fourth. Let's increase it to a half. 
Um, and over time, you, you can almost think of that as modified OIT in the sense that uh, you're, you're slowly introducing that, that, that heated protein on a regular basis. Uh, at least in my opinion, I think that works really, really well and I've had great success with it. If you have a big time lapse between, let's say that a provider was not comfortable with doing that and you have a time lapse between, you know, them coming to the clinic and having that fourth of a muffin and then they come back, let's say, six months later and let's say the infant was not, you know, regularly eating that fourth of a muffin, like it was very, you know, unclear how much they, muffin they were actually eating at home. Do you have, do you see any role for repeating um, specific IgE testing to that food before you re-challenge them? No, I, I think, I mean, in that time frame, there's, I don't think there's enough time that's gone by to change that. Uh, but I think you can still approach the challenge in, in a graded fashion so that you're starting with a small amount and moving forward. Um, now, if, if that patient came back years later, I would say we might yeah, repeat some tests. But I think if there's a, a short enough time frame in between, uh, I, I think that, that would be unnecessary testing, in my opinion. Okay, and then one last question. Um, so, you know, I, I do think, I do agree with you wholeheartedly that I think there is a lot of hesitancy to doing these oral food challenges, and that kind of becomes a learned behavior during many, many people's fellowships. How do you propose breaking that cycle or, you know, how, how do you propose kind of tackling that? Because I do think that is a problem that kind of exists probably throughout our whole country. So what do you what do you think about that? I mean, it's definitely tough. I mean, having the requirements is helpful, but, you know, and I don't know where exactly the the. Um, the fear is coming from in the sense that, you know, you might be training at a hospital who might only get referrals for very high risk infant or, or food challenges. So the only, the only react, the only, the only experience with food challenges you have are patients that are having anaphylaxis all the time. If that's, if that's the case at your, at your training center. So maybe that might be causing more fear. Uh, um, of course, when you go into the clinical practice, you're getting all comers. So you're not seeing that severe subset. Um, but I, I, I'm not sure if, I mean, at least in my clinical experience at the Cleveland Clinic, uh, I saw lots of normal food challenges that passed, and I saw some ones that didn't. Um, but I, I think it has to do also with the the way you approach your practice in general, and that's just a personal preference. You know, are you are you more conservative in general, like not just with with food challenges, but with other um, aspects of your of your management and other and other conditions? Are you more of a do you, do you take risks or do you try new things before they've been approved? Or, you know, I think that all goes down to your, your personal preferences and personality as well. I mean, that, those are hard things to change because everyone's different. But I think from a training perspective, I think it behooves the fellowship coordinators and, and the attendings that you're working with to, to really focus in on this. And, and the problem is a lot of those um, f physicians and, and trainers don't have as much experience because, they're, again, they're, they're in academic, academia and they're, they're publishing, they're doing other things, but they're also not doing as many challenges as, let's say, a private practice does. I mean, like I said, I do, I do three to four a day, so it's, and, and that's what I walked into. Um, so it was easy for me to, to, to get more confidence. But when you're only doing, you know, uh, one to five a month, then, again, it, it gets more, it, it kind of points back to that lack of experience. And, and I think with more experience comes confidence. So it's a tough, it's a tough, uh, tough nut to crack. Justin, I have a, a kind of a case scenario. So if you see somebody at one year of age, they have a very believable peanut allergy history, you do an IgE test, let's say, and it's 15, so you're, you're sure they have a peanut allergy. You follow up with them five years later, their IgE is less than two, family's interested in pursuing a challenge you think it's reasonable to do. Is there a, a timeline between you when you ran that IgE test to find out it's less than two and when that challenge would be done where you feel comfortable? And the scenario comes into if they're seen by one of our providers, they do the test that for whatever reason there's a delay for 14 months to get in to do the challenge here. Do you feel that it's necessary to have that recent IgE level do you feel like it's acceptable to push through the challenge or do you, do you need to repeat it type of thing? And we, we run into this somewhat frequently, unfortunately. Yeah. I, establish it's, a policy. Yeah, it's, it's a good question. I, I would say that, you know, really looking at the trends long term, if they're available, are really helpful. So if, if you saw that that patient was at 15, but, you know, over the years it went from 15 to 10 and then 10 to, you know, 8 and then 8 to 5 and then 5 to 2, I would say I, there's no need to repeat those tests because, again, you, you've already seen that trend. It's, it, it seems to be going in the right direction, not the wrong direction. So very rarely do I see those roller coasters go up and down and up and down. I usually see it's either going up or it's going down. Um, 
So I, I think unless, again, it's years in between the, the test being done, if it's a few months or even even a year, I would say that there's no need to repeat that test because you've already seen that, 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 that trend moving in the right direction. Okay. And kind of as a general rule, we some of us have accepted, oh, it's within 12 months, it's probably reasonable. And then the dilemma is what happens when it's 13 or 15 months and do you need to repeat it? And for a family, mm -hmm. that's a big deal because of cost and lab visit and and, and sometimes, I mean, in those situations, if they're off antihistamines, doing a skin yeah. test in the office is also great because you can get that data immediately, and and it's not as uh, uh, much of a hassle for the for the parent and the kid. Um, but yeah, I mean, th those are t difficult situations where you're you're trying to figure out what's what's best, and and that comes with experience. But um, but yeah, I mean, it, it's 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 tough when you get those those delayed issues. And, and I would say having a conversation with the parents and the kid, I mean, if you if you really would like some updated values, I can't, most, I've never been said, I've never been told like we would refuse to do it. We want to do a challenge. Most parents are willing to do it as long as it improves the safety of their of their kid. Yeah. Yeah, my, my hesitancy with going with the skin test is because it's more of an art than a science is getting discrepant values. And I, I have seen that. So, um, but, but I appreciate the, the input. And that and that's a big issue too. And I didn't really address that. There are tons of discrepancies with skin and blood tests. You know, I can't tell you how many times I've gotten either neg negative or almost low negative uh, serum testing, and then a really high positive skin test, and vice versa. And you know, at the beginning of this, I used to challenge. You know, let's say I thought skin tests were more accurate, so I would challenge all the negative uh, skin tests. But then I would have reactions because they had blood, high blood plasma, and, and vice versa. So again, that that's that's the confusing part, and that's where new tests and better, you know biologic markers are, are indicated because it can be super frustrating. And, and that might, might add to the other frustration or concern or reason why not as many people do challenges is because they really have difficulty interpreting the data. Right. Yeah, we, we've had the pendulum swing. We, you know, like everybody, it was all skin tests and, and yeah. the immunocap and things came along. We lean more IgE specific and then, then it's kind of come back to One's easier. Some are on antihistamines. means you can't. Um, yeah. Cost. And then the bottom line is, some of us are like, well, do we need both? And then I kind of wonder how many people are knocking off a challenge just because we go to both when one's positive and one's relatively <laughs> negative. But yeah. So that's like you said, more of the art. Yeah. <laughs> Makes